Hello and welcome back to Sitting in Jams. Today you're listening to episode number 17. And I tell you what, it feels like it's been a minute since we've done one of these because last week it was Jack and then the week before I think we were all busy and we didn't manage to record. And so it's been a wee while since we actually sat down to do one of these episodes. Unfortunately, Jack can't be with us today because he's busy. But we got me and Callum, so you're just going to have to put up with our uh, Scottish accents for the next 30 minutes or so. <laughs> well, part of the reason why we've not been doing as regular podcasts is because we've all been super busy doing various things, from travelling to just being super busy with work, and Callum has been moving house, which is quite exciting, but I can imagine it's been very stressful. Yeah, stressful is an understatement, to be honest. Um, everything that can go wrong with a house move went wrong essentially, um, from van drivers catching COVID to not having the Wi-Fi sorted when I'm in so that I can't continue with lessons and stuff like that. So um, for a start, Easter holidays are going to be me catching up with admin and catching up with uh, lessons that I need to make up for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's just one of those things that you can't really, you can plan as much ahead as you want, but just some things get in the way and you just have to deal with it and just, yeah, just see see what you can do with what you've got. Um you know, eventually got everything moved out and then it was a, a bunch of stuff with s- stuff still being left at the other place and my tenancy being done and then having to just pay some drivers or delivery people to just move the stuff that I needed moved um, and then it was done and I was just like that's that's all I need done then I can worry about everything else I just want everything else out of the old place so that I can say bye to that place um, nice. it was yeah it, at the height of the stress was my 30th birthday <laughs> Oh which yeah, was, which was kind of funny. Um, I managed to fit a wee a wee birthday meal, um, at some point in that day. But that was that was probably like the height of the the stress for the move. Um, and then yeah, yeah. Now we're now we're here. Now we're rolling. Uh, cool. Now we've got Wi Fi back. Evidently. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sweet. So, well, yeah, maybe we're, we're maybe good. we can get into some of that stuff in a bit. Um, I think that there's probably a lot of. I don't know, maybe funny or like learning points that you can maybe share with us from that because moving house as a working musician can be quite stressful, I think. I mean, moving house for anybody is said to be like one of the most stressful things in your life. For sure. But I think when you work online, it's particularly stressful. Um, And when you're teaching, you need an environment that is, well, you're able to get people in and out or, you know, whatever your your setup is, it needs needs to be working for you to be making money and paying bills, right? but exactly yeah maybe we should fill them in on what we've been up to like since before then i guess you sort of said that you've you've been moving house but i um i don't know if i mentioned this in the last episode it's, it feels like it's been a long time since it recorded but i was actually in the isle of sky up in the upward part of scotland on the side somewhere um and that was fantastic it was like it was like being in lord of the rings for like four days like all that scenery it was just absolutely beautiful and it was great to spend time with my brother and dad as well um and then i came back and had a super busy couple of weeks and then i went to see thundercat in amsterdam which was an absolute mind-bending experience like that's amazing do you like thundercat yeah like, are you hip to his music yeah yeah because halfway through the gig i was like callum particularly like i think you would love this like he started talking about how he's been working with like, this japanese uh, game composer or something like that and oh what? Uh, or he can like anime and like all that kind of stuff and i was like i can totally like it makes sense when i hear him play and i'm like wow i can hear all those influences but yeah i was surprised actually that the gig was it was really like 40 percent singing like his songs and then they just sh- played their ass off for like 60% of it. Like they were shredding. Like they went so f- far in the other direction from where I expected them to go. But I was pleasantly surprised because, you know, I love intense jazz fusion music. <laughs> and they definitely delivered on that front. It was insane. So good. That sounds like I'm very jealous. I was yeah. Yeah, very gutted when I seen the, when the video, and when you posted the videos on your stories. Yeah, I mean, they Looked even, awesome. like, they'd done this sort of mashup thing. They were talking about Taylor Hawkins and they, they'd done a tribute to him. But before that, they had mentioned, like, Chick Corea and Mac Miller. And they'd done some mashup where it was, like, a song that was a tribute for Taylor Hawkins. And then they'd done two Chick Corea tunes, which were just insane. Uh, and then at the end of the gig, they played a, a Mac Miller song. Which was just, it was, it was just amazing because everybody loves Matt Miller. 
Um, oh, it, it was crazy. But yeah, I've had like such a... I was speaking to Calm about this the other day. Like this last two months or so, like the last two months have been so up and down, like intense highs. And then like sort of coming down from that can be quite sort of like um, difficult sometimes. So I'm looking forward to the next couple months to sort of flatline for a bit and just sort of work on the stuff that I'm working on. And we actually both of us have some really exciting gigs coming up. So if you are in Scotland, uh, just keep an eye out on our socials for where we're playing. We're going to be headlining Hindoor Festival. We're playing at a festival called Knocking Gorick, which I've never played it. Um, collaborating with Chris Drever at that. And then we are doing a... I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. No, I think I will be allowed to say it. We're doing a fringe show, um, which is going to be awesome. So there's going to be a 10 or 11 shows, I think, for that in august which is i mean that's that's great that would be great that. i think we've got um the other one i remember is solas festival don't know if i've yes. played that one before oh and kelburn kelburn is like have you ever been to kelburn i've not i've seen many things but i've never been it is the coolest festival you ever see if you're listening you're in the uk like check out kelburn festival it's uh it's such a vibe like it really is it's, it's so cool i played there once like four or five years ago and i was only there for the one day but i wish i was there for the whole weekend I should have just bought a ticket. Um, but maybe this time we will stay for the whole weekend and have a good time. Fingers but crossed. Anyway, Callum, you have just moved house. As I said, it's like, well, as you've said, it's super stressful. What have been some learning points from that process of moving house? Um, or challenges you've had to deal with that... Just like whatever your plan is or whatever dates that you have planned, just like, just bring them forward. Like whenever, whenever you think you can get these things done by that date, it's just like, bring it like two weeks earlier. <laughs> that's, that's one. That would definitely, and it's, you know, plenty of people might have plenty of experience moving house. I just don't. <laughs> so there's loads of learning curves, but um, yeah, wi- Wi-Fi was the big one. That's like, you know, you totally feel like, oh, first world problems, right? <laughs> it's like your Wi-Fi is not working in your new house. Um... But, you know, with the, the modern day musician and teacher, like it's just, it's, it's an essential. It's not something that we can really kind of do without um, when a lot of our work depends on that. Um, but yeah, there's not too many, not too many learning curves, especially it kind of just has a, a you know, a hindrance on the amount of music that I can do and the amount of practice that I can do. So those kind of, th- those kind of things go on hold a little bit mm. um, while you get settled. But it's like, I definitely think take the time to get settled and, you know, think about the spaces that you're trying to create and maybe like the new environment and mm. um yeah just so that you can get into that headspace it's like right now this is you know this is still a bedroom and this is going to change in a few months i'm going to have a room that's going to be like the teaching room the studio room um and there's going to be a lot of work put into that so that i can make it that creative space because it's always been this way for me it's always like divide one room into that's where you sleep and this is this is the work brain this is like when you mm. get when you get you know get the cogs working so it's, it would be really nice to have that separation mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that I can just go into that room for, for that specific thing and then just chill out in here. Right. Um, I'll, I'll really look forward to that. That's cool. a big one. All right. Given the change in your environment recently and the fact that you're thinking about this new setup, are you feeling more or less inspired to create? Because I know personally that change in environment plays a huge role in how... I guess how inspired I feel to create at that moment. I'm a big fan of shifting stuff about, and it's not uncommon for people to come around and be like, you've just flipped the room in, I don't know, 90 degrees. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I have. <laughs> Stimulates the brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't actually done it to this space uh, for the couple of years I've been here, but, you know, maybe I'm due a, a couple of new pictures on the wall or something. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll definitely be a lot more creative. Um, I want to be, but I just haven't got that time yet. Um, and not just creative in the musical sense, but, you know, we've got, like, a, a nice garden space here. So me and uh, a housemate are really thinking about things that we can do DIY. And, uh, you know, we've got all these big plans. Like, we want to DIY our own sauna. And, um, like, yeah, like, big, big wow. ones, man. You know, like, a lot of a lot of, a lot of big things. Um, get some... We're now in talks with... Uh, or in talks with each other about getting some sort of, like, ship in barrel so that we can do some... Um, some Wim Hof kind of ice oh, cold cool. therapy. 
um, things like that. So yeah, just there's loads of ideas flowing, not musically, ju not just musically. Um, you know, when you said shipping barrel, I thought about a shipping container, and I was like, they're big <laughs> and really heavy. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, right, I don't I think um, I don't know if I'll ever get the money to buy one of them. <laughs> <laughs> who knows, man? Who yeah, knows? who knows? You can only dream. <laughs> exactly, but yeah. So I suppose like the creativity has been happening. It's just not exactly musical, which is mm. you know that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, if you're a creative person, you'll find ways to be creative, regardless if it's the thing that your your primary thing. You know, you think if it's art or if it's music, people who are creative are just creative in all areas. I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that despite the fact that the move, and you know, I can reflect and say like the time, the holidays that I've had as well, which yes, are really nice and much less stressful than um, moving house, but I do see each one of those events as an opportunity to be distracted by something that isn't creative necessarily you know like I, I can sort of be creative when I'm away and I can think about stuff but time away from the instrument we both know how beneficial that is and I'm sure that yeah I'm sure that we both have a lot to say on taking yourself away from the instrument and sometimes I am grateful for that stress that takes me away from it because when I go back hence my question I am a bit more inspired to do something and I know for me that you know, coming out of this, um, yeah, these couple of breaks that I've had, which I really needed, I've started to think about what I might want to do uh, differently in the next couple of months, next six months. I signed a new contract with uh, Angelico and Supro and Pigtronics. Wow, mm -hmm. nice. Uh, which is awesome. And so I've been thinking about how I can, yeah, what I can bring to the table with that this year and just having space out of this tiny little box that I work in all the time. Uh, yeah, it gives you perspective. And I think that that is incredibly important in whatever it is you're doing. If you've not had a break for two or three, let's say three months, like just even a day, take a day off and just get out and try to ignore what is that you do every day because you will find uh, a little bit more. I, I mean, I think you will find a little bit more drive to come back and do it once you're away from it. Um, it's good to Definitely. create space. Do you feel the same? Yeah. 100%. It's difficult to do it. It's easy to say it. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. I, I'm an advocate of... Especially when it's your job, right? It's like you kind of, you need to make money and, you know, self-employed, like, I mean, we're not getting paid holidays. No. And, you know, most of us, you know, like do something work-wise or work-related every day of the week. Mm -hmm. That's that's the difficult thing. It's like, you know, a lot of people that might have that 9 to 5, it's like they'll, they'll grind out those hours from Monday to Friday. And then, you know, it's... it's essentially the short holiday for the weekend mm -hmm. but you know we really have to plan our holidays in advance a lot because we a lot of the time have to take the work that we get in front of us mm -hmm. and that might mean just working solidly but then conversely you need to try and have that bit of a break too yeah especially when it hits you know following teaching terms that's a big one it's like kind of taking advantage of the teaching terms and um i think i'll get up i'm thinking that i'll get a lot of time for creativity when it hits like the summer holidays mm. i'll have plenty of time for that When's the um, summer holidays? Because so, I don't, you know this, but like I don't work with the teaching uh, thing, the term so like, dates. I, th I think, um, I always forget, I literally forget every year, but I think it's uh, somewhere like middle of July, I think, yeah. um, where the schools maybe stop. I can't actually remember. It's always something that I need May, to June, look at Yeah, it's like I always remember August was like summer holiday time, right? Yeah. And you come back yeah. like maybe the end, 28th or something? That's usually when like fringe stuff stuff happens. I think. Oh, is it right? I think. Oh, so. I, I can't like, remember, man. It's, no, no, fringe is throughout August. I think it finishes on the twenty eighth or something. Cool. Or the yeah. I don't know. But anyway, I remember when I was a kid, like how long summer holidays felt. Like, do you remember like the the month or two months or whatever it is? Like it felt. No, it was seven weeks. Now. It was seven weeks, wasn't it? Yeah. It felt like an existence. <laughs> <laughs> like I remember thinking, like you know, I could pretty much. I don't know. I could just forget everything I ever learned in maths in that time <laughs> and then just go back and I'd have to start again. But it was, um, I just remember thinking how long that is. And then I got into my last year of high school and I, the listener, I don't know if you got this situation, but what we got was this little beautiful thing called study leave. And in your last year of high school, which for me was my sixth year, that's the last year you can do in high school, we 
I think we got to about May or something. And then we got study leave for about a month or something, I think. Um, and that was to study for the exams that were coming up, like your finals, your final year uh, exams. And then once you'd done your exams, if you were going to university or college, you had until September. So I remember having a three-month holiday. And I was like, like three, six, nine, that's a quarter of the year where I'm out of school. That was like the, the most beautiful thing ever. Like, you don't get that now, do you? I don't think so. Like, can you comprehend having three months off? Nope. <laughs> it doesn't exist, um, does yeah. it? <laughs> no, it totally doesn't. It totally doesn't. That seems completely alien. I think we got to get on that passive income. we got to start <laughs> writing books and, like, I don't know. Sell our the souls dip. and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> buying the dip, exactly. Do you feel an ounce of that going into summer holidays now? Or is it more just, like... Oh, I better fill the space. Um, I think it's definitely going to be a lot more leisurely. But, you know, because most of the commitments that I've got will stop during the teaching terms. Um, but I'll probably keep private students and things like that if they, if they want to keep going as well. I usually do that throughout the summer and throughout school holidays for private tuition. Because it just kind of, you know, it just means that there's, there's certain weeks that maybe you've got like zero income. Um, I try and minimise that as much as possible because if you think about the certain months in the year where there's maybe like, um, you might not know this if you've, you know, you get a lot of your own private students and you don't follow school terms, but if you say you have that week off at the end of December and you have that week off at the beginning of January and then you have that week off for your February break, um, you've essentially nearly missed out like a month's wage just about over the course of three, four months. So that hits hard, man. Like you've got, you've got a plan. Like that's something that I've definitely struggled with over the years, um, especially when you're in your first few years of self-employment and you don't have a lot of work. You're really still trying to build the foundation of your business. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important to try and see ahead for those months, and it's just something that like it doesn't come natural to me at all. Like I really need to knuckle down and, and get the dates sorted out so that I can plan ahead for those things financially. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a good tip if you're, you know, newly self-employed and that's now your bread and butter. Like that's that's how you that's how you earn a living. Yeah. You've got to look at these things in the I, th I think the it's year. unfortunate that in school and college and university there isn't at least in in the uh the subject of music, there isn't enough education on being self employed and what that means. Because the reality is that if you're studying music and you want to work in music, you're probably going to be self-employed. Whether that means like you have a business and you work for someone, like a record label or something, it's like you're probably still going to be freelance selling yourself to them. And yeah, there's not enough education. I remember my one of my teachers was kind of frustrated at that. And she was like, all right, I'm going to sacrifice one of our classes to tell you as much as I can in an hour. And that was really nice. But, you know, we need a... A couple more hours you know and i think it is important to look forward as well but yeah i guess my point initially is you know <laughs> these forced holidays can be maybe not financially viable but mentally and creatively and emotionally like yeah really uh really worth it and i guess just to go back to the the initial question it's like do you feel at all <laughs> Um, that although you've taken that hit of being like stressed and all that, like maybe you've got a little bit more of a drive to get going once you're settled. Yeah, because of the new space and like I think everything that happens when you're in a new space, like your brain just works differently. You think of new ideas, you think of different things that you can do with the space that you're in. Mm. Um, that's that's kind of the process that I'm going through now. That now that I'm starting to get a little bit more settled here. Um, so yeah, it'll, you know, I'm sure. If you're, you know, like coming back to the podcast and checking out the later, um, later episodes, you might hear about developments and stuff like that and see where things go. Mm. Cool. And do you have any plans for this space? I know you said that you want to get the uh, one of the other rooms into like a studio and teaching room. Like, yeah. what, what does that look like? Because you're someone who has a lot of experience working in a studio. It's like, I'm wondering, how are you going to kit this space out? What do you want it to look like? Do you have a vision for it or is it just going to be... Um, it'll be, it'll be a long process to get it done right. You know, I don't want to rush these things because sometimes it's easy to just go and try and rush these things and, um, 
yeah, maybe just try buy the cheapest kind of thing that you like everything that you might feel like you need in a studio, just go and buy the kind of cheapest thing and then you might not have maybe as good a work in studio um, or something like that. But one of the, even just one of the kind of first problems that I've, I've bumped into is that there, there's actually not a lot of um, power or, you know, power sockets in the, in the house. Uh, and the room that I want to change into the studio, there's one. Wow. So instantly before I do anything, I need to pay an electrician to get like another three or four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like before I do anything. Because you Imagine know much... setting up your whole studio to one outlet. You're, you're just going to like turn on an amp and your speakers are going to pop and your tone's going to be like... Yep. Like right now, like the reason that I've got all of this running is because I've got one plug back there next to my bed that's got a four gang that's right on the left side of me here. And that's plugged into another four gang that goes round the <laughs> wow, <laughs> round the other side of the unit. All right, um, and it's yeah, I'm not using everything obviously all at the same time, but that's like eight plugs <laughs> in one plug. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Oh wow, it sounds so like one lasted. of those like memes. It's like how can you fit eight into like some stupid division thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like he got that. <laughs> yeah, um, oh. but yeah, like I've, I think you know I, I've I've spent a wee bit wee bit money on like good like power extension so I, I should be i should be fine you know it's not some shoddy job mm. um and you know cheap cheap electronics and stuff like that i should be i should be safe for the meantime until i get things moving um but yeah in terms of the studio space i definitely like to get a new desk desk space something that's got um like say something like these kind of x legs so that you've got lots of space underneath get something that's got like a nice space for like your 88 key um, keyboard that I can fit underneath and it's got like the roller that you can you can bring out that would be great for space um, mainly just trying to be space efficient you know as, as, as much as possible um, and then apart from that maybe upgrade on you know not running everything from the laptop maybe mm -hmm. try and get like a, a unit of some sort um, and that would probably probably be the majority because I've got monitors I've got bikes um, most of that stuff is there Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah it's, it's a difficult one one of the things that you know I suppose this is if you kind of get into mixing but it obviously still helps you to hear what you're maybe making if you're if you're creating music is um, how you put up your acoustic treatment and what acoustic treatment you might need now one of the tests that I learned from a book called Mixing, Mixing Secrets I can't remember I've got it somewhere here but I can't remember the um, author but um, there's a specific book uh, there's a specific bit in that book that talks about what are called nodes and anti-nodes. Um, and those are basically points in, in a room where certain frequencies can, can build up or can be completely silent. So, for example, if you kind of took, like, the dimensions of this room or just kind of try to slice, like, think of the room as a cube and then slice that into just lines, basically. At certain points in that room, you know, where I'm sitting right now, 80 hertz, just for pure example, could be like boosted, like maybe something like ridiculous, like 10 or 15 decibels. Um, and that's just because of all the reflections that are happening and the build up that might happen at this specific point in the room. So that if I literally just move mm. that far back, a totally different frequency could be boosted there or completely silent. Um, I think it's the, the anti nodes that are the ones that are higher in volume. Mm -hmm. And then the nodes that are like, that creates more silence. Um, there's a video that I watched years ago that explained it really well. And they, they've they just got like a spring and then it's got a hook on each end so that it's uh, it's being pulled apart. And they send a frequency through it and then they put like a bit of card at certain points in the spring. And at certain points in the spring there will be like inertia. Inertia is like, I think that's that's when there's, there's zero movement. There's nothing happening. Um... And there's points where you put that card in the spring and there's no movement at all. And then there's other parts where it'll just flap really, really quickly. And that's to demonstrate or show mm -hmm. these build up, uh, build ups of certain frequencies within your room. So I'll be taking that into account. You know, there's there's quite easy tests that you can you could probably go into YouTube and type in like white noise test or pink noise test. And it's just going to go through all these bleeps at different frequencies. And if you do that in your own room, you can literally hear certain frequencies just get super loud. And it's not that they're actually louder. They're mm. not louder. They're just, it's the build up of all the frequencies bouncing back. 
into that specific point in your room. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, it's something that not a lot of people, you know, if you're like a home studio person and you've maybe cut some corners and you don't know as much about that stuff and you're mixing as well, that, that could be a real problem because you can maybe hear that there's so much bass in your track so you don't, you don't EQ any bass and then you go to listen to it in your car or on your iPod or your phone or anything like that and there's no bass. Mm-hmm. So you can overcompensate and undercompensate for things too. It's a really interesting subject. Like I find that stuff yeah. super interesting. Um, I've never considered that because I don't mix and I mean, I don't have any interest or the skills to do so. But what I have realized in different spaces is that certain notes on my instrument will just make the whole room shake. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, whoa, A flat is summoning the devil right now. It's uh, summoning, <laughs> summoning. That sounds like an M&M <laughs> word, that yeah. one. <laughs> But um, yeah, in this room, I'm from what I remember, I think A flat has a bit of a a vibe. But this is a weird room. Like mm-hmm. it looks like it's a square, and it is. But here is actually downstairs. Like it's it's weird, and I have massive glass windows that cover the whole length of the house, which is not ideal for recording. And hence why I di everything and don't mix my own stuff. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I I wouldn't choose to record amps at home. I'm kind of past that. Like I, yeah, same I've here. never had the space that would really allow it to make sense. You know, it's always too loud for an apartment or a house that's like stuck in a log or whatever. And uh, yeah, going DI is just so easy. And I can show up to a gig with a pedal board and I'm ready. If it's an arena, I'm fine. If it's a tiny pub gig, I'm fine. If it's a lesson through Zoom, I am fine. I don't have to mic anything and annoy people, which is, I think, quite nice. No, I totally agree. I, I love just being in the box, everything basically being rooted through, through the laptop. Mm-hmm. Cool, man. All right, I have a question for you, just based on the kind of topic that we found ourselves in. So if you could give, let's say, a couple tips to people who are interested in setting up a home studio what would they be and do you have any specific pieces of kit that you think are essential perhaps let's just say it's for your average joe who's like you know i want to learn to make my own little tracks maybe play some guitar and bass um maybe even acoustic guitar maybe some singing like what tips would you have and are there any pieces of gear that you think are essential good question um i think one of the big ones is there's always there's all, always DIY versions of everything that you're thinking of. There's always someone who's done a cheaper version of, you know, the big grandioso version of what you're thinking of. Um, so I'm looking into that because there's a lot of people that have created, you know, their own desk um, by putting together some IKEA stuff, like buy a couple of things from IKEA, um, maybe like screw in some sort of... Um, shelf like underneath your your desk for like your keyboard and things like that if you've got like something that's 88 keys um so that you can do things you know diy and it's much cheaper so that would be a good go-to because studio desks are a fortune they're so expensive and it really you know they might be built really well but just the money that it comes to for like a, a proper studio desk can be like two grand two and a half, probably more than two and a half grand um, so that would be the first one is like, just look up loads of DIY versions and see if you can find something that'll fit the space that you're in for a lot cheaper. Um, cause that's, you know, you always have to do things to a budget and that kind of brings me on to the next one, which is you might have, you might get one of these bundles where you get an interface, you get headphones, you get a mic and they're usually like a great starter and starting pack. Um, but there's obviously some limitations with that as well. It might depend if you see yourself recording more than one instrument or two instruments. Maybe you want to record a whole drum kit. Now, you can obviously do that with a couple of mics um, with certain micing techniques. But if you want more channels, then you obviously you need to invest in something a bit more. So if you invest in a really good interface, um, that's going to take you a long way. Um, but then there's the whole thing as well. Is it, you know, is it Apple that you're using? Is it like Windows or like whatever other kind of computer? We'll just assume that it's like they got a MacBook and they need to record two channels. You know, it's like some, yeah. something simple. Well, then, to be honest, your bundle things are always going to be the most yeah. value for your money. I, I would agree. Um, I think some of the some of the Focusrite stuff is really good value for money. In fact, I'm using the Focusrite Scarlet 2i2, I think it's called. 
not the best. Like, I wouldn't want to record on Taylor Swift record with it. But it's good enough for pretty much everything that I've done so far. I, no complaints. Now, I would like to upgrade it at some point, but it's totally fine for the time being. And, um, yeah, I just, I'll throw in one tip. Yeah. And it's don't go overboard with, like, just buying stuff that you saw other people use. Because I bet that compressor rack that someone else used, like, I don't know. You could probably get a similar effect if you're just starting out for something, you know, something that's inbuilt on Logic, you know. It's like you don't need to go and get all the craziest gear just to get started. And in fact, Logic is a great place to start because the sounds that are inbuilt, you can control all the parameters and you can really get a lot out of them. And, you know, the the rack mounts and all that are cool, but it's like, do you really need it right now if you're just making a little EP at home and it's the first thing you've ever done, you know? It's like, don't, don't just buy a bunch of gear. Like, try and work with a little bit less. In fact, for the longest time, I just went DI to... Uh, logic through my scarlet and i just designed a bunch of tones on that and it was it was fine you know i recorded on people's records with like logic tones and like nobody's gonna know it some of them sound really good it just depends what you do with them but yeah that's, yeah that's one thing i want to add in you know that's totally true um you see a lot of videos of people mixing with just default plugins in logic and it's like they do a really professional job because they know what they're doing. It's like definitely it's more about knowing the tools, knowing how to use everything and getting good at what you do rather than, you know, compensate and just buy the best gear and use it like to an amateur level. You know, mm-hmm. I would to kind of lack for a better word. It's like a lot of the time it, it might be compensating for that lack of skill too. So it's yeah, like getting yeah. really, really good at what you're at what you're trying to do. Just really spend a lot of time. Yeah. If all right, so I am I'm not a skilled keyboard player, right? And I'm, I'm going to assume that a lot of people who are listening maybe, <laughs> maybe aren't, right? And um, I'm wondering, I mean, I know the answer because I use one, but how useful would a MIDI keyboard be for someone who's a home kind of producer? Or they're writing their own stuff at home. That's that's the essential, I think. Um, I would agree. Yeah, for, for me, because I like the, you know, piano VSTs and stuff like that. And um, I, I had to go for something that was 88 keys, but depends on what kind of music that you're doing you know you can simply you might not have as much scope with you know frequency spectrum and playing to the extremes of you know the piano but you've always got octave buttons on like a you know a keyboard that might be like this size well that's exactly yeah yeah and that's that's like all you need a lot of the time especially Mm -hmm. if you're layering stuff you know that's that's the other thing as well depending on how you record yeah you you won't need that you won't need something like this that i've got here Mm. um I used that mainly because I wanted something multi-purpose. I wanted something that I could create on. I wanted something I could teach on too. Mm-hmm. Um, but at some point, I'll probably get a nice digital piano so that I don't need to go straight into yeah. Logic as well. Um, so it's all these all these other things that you just kind of go through yeah. or find I, out through the process. One thing that's worth mentioning there that we've kind of just glossed over is a MIDI keyboard isn't just going to sound like a keyboard. You could program it to sound like a guitar or a set of bagpipes or a didgeridoo or you could play the drums on it. Um, the idea with the MIDI keyboard is that you can take the keyboard and use it as a some sort of interface to trigger other sounds. So when I'm recording at home, uh, let's just say I don't like the sound of my bass guitar for whatever reason, I could program a upright MIDI bass or a saxophone, but use my keyboard to play the notes. And I can change the octave and such on the on the keyboard itself. And this is this is a super cheap keyboard. I think it cost me like twenty five pounds or something it's not great well i mean it's not great as in like it's like a keyboard player probably wouldn't use this at a gig but for me you know i can i can still get the same sounds as callum or like someone else if it's available as like a a vst what a vst is virtual software instrument is that right or yeah yeah i just always class it as a virtual instrument yeah a virtual instrument so if you are wondering well, if I've got my interface, my guitar, you know, maybe you've got a couple of pedals, for example. What if I want a grand piano or a... What's another wacky instrument? Um, Did like you an redo? organ or... It doesn't yeah, have to be yeah. keys, so that's the thing. It's like, it, it could, could be, be a the choir. drums. A choir, there we go. There's a good one. A choir in the right hand and a... I don't know, a, a synth pad in the right, let's just say. I'm totally mixing up my hand right now. 
but you get the point. <laughs> you can program that on a MIDI keyboard. And to me, that is just the most cool thing ever. And it means that, you know, my limited knowledge of the keyboard, I can just push a button and it's like, whoa, that sounds cool. And it makes creating music with other instruments so much more accessible. Because as I said, I'm not a piano player and I do not have access to a choir. <laughs> so it makes it, uh, makes it totally possible. And Absolutely. Yeah, so I think the point we're at right now is that you need some sort of recording interface. Agree? Yep. Um, obviously your instruments, but we're going to uh, just say that that's a given. And we both agree that MIDI keyboard is essential. Now, I feel like there's one piece of the equation that might be missing, and it's these things. Because if you're going to record your own songs, um, let's just assume you're going to be singing. And if you're not going to be singing, let's just assume you want to record acoustic guitar, for example. Even though you could do that through Logic. Um, I think it's useful to have a mic in the house. You might want to sample a shaker or... That would sound great in the track that I'm writing. You know, I might, yes, I might just use that. <laughs> and, you know, sampling stuff is really fun when you have a microphone. And, of course, you can use your phone to do that as well. But um, a mic is quite nice. Now, Callum, if someone was starting their studio and they've got the couple pieces of gear that we just mentioned... Would you recommend, in fact, what type of microphone would you recommend they get? Because obviously we can, we can you look can't, at You like... can't go wrong with like SM57. It's like the most robust mic that you can get. Um, it's always like, especially like say you, you've got your laptop and you're traveling too. It's just like you can just, you can throw that thing off the ground probably multiple times and it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, so for longevity and something that's just like, it's not too expensive um, and it'll last you such a long time. Uh, that's definitely one of the, the go-tos especially if you record like a cab, um, mm -hmm. if you record vocals, samples, like anything like that. A any mic can do that, but at the same time, you've got to think about the space that you're in too, because that's what I was mentioning earlier. If you've got all these kind of frequencies building up and cancelling something out potentially, um, when you like record uh, on Logic, mm -hmm. you know, it's actually, it's not maybe as much about the mic as it is about the space that the mic is in. Right. You know what I mean? Just yeah, because yeah. you could have the most expensive mic in the world, but, you know, in this box room with no acoustic treatment and you clap and just check for, I don't know, like any frequency buildups, like just in the little hallway that we've got, you might get some crazy sounds in there because you've got any kind of hallway and you go into it and you clap. There's always some sort of like sonic phenomenon that just sounds really weird. One of the things that you get is called like a, a flutter echo. And a flutter echo is basically where you have all these high pitched frequencies that bounce off parallel surfaces really high so you hear this kind of zinging kind of effect that happens like up the way um mm. if you it happens if you're in the middle of like two concrete buildings that are maybe quite close together just like just go around clapping in front of things like <laughs> just like see what things sound like it's really it's interesting nice just how so sound you, travels but yeah yeah so you're saying a dynamic microphone compared to a condenser microphone would be a little bit more versatile for someone who's just starting out and is maybe just like they might want to do a wee bit of vocals or guitar or micing up things. Just a dynamic yeah. mic. SM57, super robust. You could use it as a bottle opener or a microphone. It's probably going to work for both really 100%. well. <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, I've got a lot of friends who have recorded things on phones too. And they've got maybe just like a plug-in set of headphones that's got a mic on it. And they get pretty good results, just like especially hearing some vocals just on that. So if you're mm. really, really low budget, and again, you know what you're doing maybe when it comes to post-processing and mixing and things like that you can do it as budget as you want mm -hmm. really you know and you could get a pair of those headphones for a tenner <laughs> yeah yeah and for those who are keen to learn more about recording techniques and getting started as a home record like session musician or producer or whatever you might be where do you recommend people going to learn more because i know that people obviously you know you can do a, a master's degree or a phd in these things but where where did you learn? Um, so one of the experiences that I was always kind of grateful for was working with Idlewild's Rod Jones uh, on a couple of projects when I was uh, doing a bit of an internship um, at Post Electric Studio um, based in Leith. Uh, and I got to kind of sit in on just quite a few projects and I would always take my books, like I've got quite a few materials for mixing and studio work and things like that. And I'd always have my books and just sit there and kind of whenever I wasn't doing much, maybe I wasn't asked to do much, I would just be sitting reading about maybe the specific thing that they're doing or maybe a bit of hardware or gear that they had um, 
on their rack or something like that, or microphones, learning about desks. It's all that kind of stuff that you start to like need to learn, want to learn, need to learn when you're when you're in it, when you're in a studio. So to be honest, you can learn lots from home and on YouTube. But just go and try and get into a studio. I volunteered. I volunteered a lot of the time. I've done a few sessions in uh Chamber Studios too. Uh and yeah, with with Rod being the engineer for that as well. And that was just a, a great learning experience because that's where you encounter problems. That's where there was one specific problem where someone was trying to record their vocal and there was like a, I think there was a string quartet. And what was happening was it was difficult to get the level set for the vocalist so that they still felt up front in the mix because there was a quartet there. Now that was kind of overpowering. Um, and it was more up front. So I think what was happening, and he, he was singing quite far away from the mic. So I was going through my book and just trying to think of a solution because th some of the things just weren't working as much as we wanted them to. Um, and then I simply just said, let's just go as close to the mic as you possibly can be and be as direct as you as you can. And as soon as he started going up closer, like you can't go too close, otherwise you get this really big buildup of bass. Um, in the in the recording but that seemed to help that situation where we wanted things more up front um, and get the best recording that you can that's the other thing it's like you don't want to compensate and do things in post you want to mm -hmm. try and do the job really well um, with the actual recording do the best recording that you possibly can it's like one of the things i heard was um records like there is no mixing and mix like there is no mastering <laughs> so it's like do the utmost best job you know, from the sound engineer to the mixing engineer to the mastering engineer. And then that whole production line just becomes this easy, much easier process, a seamless process. Mm. Interesting. Have I ever told you the story about a twin reverb at Chamber Street Studio, like, nearly going on fire? No? no I was doing a session there, and um, it was for, like, a pop person. And, um, sorry, a pop songwriter. And... We, hmm, what was I using? I don't know what, I think I was probably just using my Strat, actually. And I had a twin reverb. And it wasn't even that loud. And um, I don't know what happened, but I just overheat and, like, smoke started pouring out. <laughs> Jeez. I don't know how old the amp was either, but it was one of those situations where it's like, it was nobody's fault. In fact, maybe it could have been serviced recently or something. Maybe that would have helped, but... I remember just being like, oh, no, I, ho I hope I've not broke his amp. But at the same time, it's like, it's it's a piece of equipment. And these tools do, uh, you know, things like that happen. But it was the first time, only time, I've ever made an amp uh, smoke. So I'm quite proud of it. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. Yeah, I probably just played like a C chord or something. It's like, <laughs> it wasn't one of those gigs where I could really, you know, crank a fuzz face and make the amp drive really hard or turn it up. Yeah. But... But cool, yeah, I man. think from yeah, that, that main tip is, you know, if you've got studios nearby you, just try and volunteer. That's that's where you'll encounter problems that you need to solve. That's mm -hmm. the main one. You won't have as many problems to solve when you're at home looking up YouTube videos. Totally. And I think it's also a good idea to, you know, if you do your home recording, pay a little bit of money to go into a studio and see how they would work with it. You know, like re record parts, see how they would mic certain instruments or what virtual instruments and instruments they might use and that will give you tips and ideas to work from it's always good to learn from those who are you know doing it properly not that home studios not doing it properly like they're you can obviously get a super super professional setup at home and also just be really good with the equipment that you have but you know the more you know the more you know and you just got to experience it right and sometimes that means paying a couple bucks to actually use a studio space and that's fine I did a session recently recording some demos for D'Angelico and I had a lot of fun just like talking with the engineer about what mics he was using and why. And we ended up using two different mics. In fact, I think we used three mics. Um, and just looking at the gear that he uses and getting an idea for how much it might cost if I wanted to use that. And yeah, you just develop your palette and awareness of what is possible and how you might be able to emulate that as well as you said you can always do it cheaper there's always another way of making it happen and yeah there's there's so much to learn it's a whole world that i'm really not like mixing and like studio gear like i know what i think i have a really good idea what works for me like being a guitarist but 
I, you know, I've not really, I wouldn't feel comfortable recording a drum kit. Like I, I know roughly how to do it. You know, I studied like a, a recording module or whatever it was at university, but it was, uh, it was so long ago and I really wasn't interested in it. You know? but yeah. It's been cool to hear you share some tips and I hope that the listeners, if you're still here with us, I mean, obviously you are if you're, you're hearing this, but anyway, <laughs> um, I hope that you have gotten something from it. And we can all reflect on this time of stress for Callum as, uh, <laughs> what's it been? It's been a time of, uh, well, potential. Change, a change in stress. Yeah. A good change in a good way. You know, it's, um, lots of new things are on the horizons. So good that's, one. that's basically it. I'm always, you know, that's, that's the one thing that I was thinking about during it. It was, it's just short term. Mm-hmm. Way better things on the other side of it. That's that's the main thing to remember. The grass is always greener, right? Exactly. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for listening. If you would like to support the podcast, you can pick up one of these nice guitar fuel sitting in mugs from our Teespring store, which is linked in the description. Calm's got the black one. You can also get these jumpers, which we call our uh, uniform. And you can also buy us a coffee if you want. All this is linked in the description to wherever you are listening. But Anyway, I think that's all from us just now. We shall see you in the next episode. Ciao.